So here's an excision from uh, the face. How do we know it's from the face? It's really useful, I think, to look at um, skin biopsies cold, like that is with no information. And I tell my fellow, don't tell me where it's from or the history or anything and see, can I figure out where it's from in the body, how old the patient is, all of those things. It's A, it's good for, for teaching, um, teaching yourself um, to recognize the different types of skin on different parts of the body. Also, it can be helpful that sometimes if I look at this and someone tells me this is from a 10-year-old's foot, then I know that we have a swapped specimen or the paperwork's wrong, right? There's no way this is from the foot. There's no way this is a 10-year-old because very good, someone picked it up. There's skeletal muscle, even from low power, you saw that, bravo, Kevin Coat, you get a bonus point, good work. Yes, yeah, skeletal muscle bundles right here in the subcutis and even up in the dermis is something that you see on facial skin or on the neck, the muscles of facial expression, I'm working to not touch my face to not you know, get coronavirus. And then also the platysma muscle on the neck, they tend to get the little fibers, get up very superficial and can be in the dermis or the subcutis, okay? So when you see that, that's helpful. Also on the face in, uh, in adults, particularly older adults, you tend to have a lot of sebaceous glands, real prominent ones, particularly like the cheeks and the nose area, the oily areas of the face. And then also we can see that the dermis, instead of being pink, is gray blue. This person has been out in the fields or on the golf course for many, many years. This is an old person who has had a lot of sun damage. The dermis should be filled with reticular collagen uh, fibers. Uh, the reticular dermis should have pink collagen bundles, but instead, most of it's been wiped out and replaced with solar elastosis. I'm not sure if you see solar elastosis this bad in Canada, but where I live in Arkansas, where we got a lot of old folks with, with light, pale skin, we see tons of this. This is, like, this is basically normal skin for over half of my patient population. All right, so this is from the face. And here is the lesion. You can see this lesion right here. And how do we tell? We can tell that this is a lesion right away because this is my internet connection's unstable. So if my audio is going out, you can just type in there and let me know. The, um, you can tell one thing is, look, the elastosis is gone. It's been replaced by pink collagen and some little islands of basaloid cells. And you can see that pink collagen is pushed down here into the, just the very top of the subcutis. These things that look like black are actually calcifications. They just didn't, they didn't show up quite right on scan. They look black, but they're actually purple calcifications. And then we see these little thin elongated cords and islands of basaloid cells that have kind of uniform cytology. They all look like each other, don't look very atypical. There's a dense co uh, collagen rich stroma. There's some cysts filled with keratin. There are some granulomas with flakes of keratin. So these are from the cysts that rupture. And so anytime we have little keratin cysts it's to in any sort of lesion in the skin, it's a good chance you're gonna start finding some little clustered keratin granulomas. You don't need to go do a fight stain or uh, a fungal stain for this. This is keratin, okay? There's little flakes of keratin right in those spaces. All right. And the tumor cells here are, are these, these long, thin cords. So anyone want to take a stab at what this uh, entity might be? There's a few different options. Okay, I'm seeing desmoplastic basal cell, desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. And there are, yeah, there are two more things you could potentially put in your differential. And MAC, and syringoma, good. And MAC stands for microcystic adnexal carcinoma. So those four um, things, um, morpheiform, sclerosing, infiltrative, whatever name you like, basal cell carcinoma, that's one. Syringoma is two. Desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, three. And microcystic adnexal carcinoma, or MAC, is four. Those four things make up what we call the, the tadpole or paisley tie differential. They're tumors that tend to make little islands that have little, little elongated tails and that sometimes have a tadpole-like shape. Let me see if I can find a good tadpole shape for you here. That's pretty good, I guess, right? It's kind of got a little head here and then a little tail uh, behind it, okay? Yes, we can add morpheiform basal in the differential diagnosis. I, I personally use the term basal cell carcinoma, comma, infiltrative type to encompass 
micronodular, morpheiform, sclerosing, all of those different types of basal, I just lump them all under infiltrative when I sign them out uh, in my pathology reports in real life. I know some people who don't like to do that and that's totally fine, but yes, basal cell carcinoma has a type where it gets little thin elongated cords and that's one of the things in the differential here, okay? Sorting that it's differential out can be challenging. I think basal cell carcinoma and syringoma are usually the easiest ones to rule out first. Most of the time, if you get a big enough biopsy, a morpheiform or in infiltrative pattern basal cell carcinoma will have some little cords like this, but it tends to have a different stroma. The stroma is not as pink and collagen rich usually. It's usually much more cellular and, and bluish mucin rich or mixoid for pathologists. Sorry, uh, in derm dermatologists use the term mucin to refer, refer to hyaluronic acid and glycosaminoglycans and pathologists use the term mixoid to refer to that. And I straddle both worlds. So when I use mucin, I mean mixoid and vice versa, okay? So I'll try to, I'll try to remember to, to point that out. But usually you have a, a kind of a cellular spindle cell rich stroma in, in, in the infiltrative forms of basal cell carcinoma and it has a bluer tinge and less pink. Now that's not always true, especially if you have a scar from a previously treated basal and now you're having a recurrence into the scar, it can have dense collagen in the background. But the other thing is that basal cell carcinoma usually will have at least some areas that have bigger nests that look more obviously like basal cell carcinoma, okay? If you get a big enough biopsy. Syringoma is easy because it almost always right away has ducts. You'll see these little tadpole shapes, but each one will have an obvious duct. You don't have to look around to hunt for ducts. You can see obvious sweat ducts in each little area of the tumor, and the ducts are, are multiple and abundant. So usually that's really easy. You see a bunch of ducts all the way, uh, these kind of little tadpole shapes with a bunch of sweat ducts in them, then you're dealing with the syringoma most likely. The, different, the differential that's really hard to sort out though is desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, which is what this is here, and microcystic adnexal carcinoma, MAC. The distinction is very important because desmoplastic trichoep is a benign tumor, and MAC is a locally very aggressive, locally aggressive tumor that often requires pretty significant surgery. It gets way down deep into the muscle and the nerves and often has a high rate of recurrence. It's a real problem for the patients that get it. And they can look very, very similar, nearly identical in some cases. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a MAC in a minute to help you see the differences. But the problem that I face is that on a small partial biopsy, which is what often happens, you often get a shave where it just shows part of it. So I see some of this and I think, well, this could be MAC or desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So I usually, on a partial biopsy, I usually tell my dermatologist, please go back and do a conservative excision of the entire lesion so I can see the bottom. Because the base of the lesion is what helps you the most, I think, in telling whether it's a MAC or a desmoplastic trichoep, okay? So here, the tumor, it kind of pushes towards the edge of the subcutis, but does not infiltrate extensively down. Most of the time, microcystic and nexal carcinoma will infiltrate deeply into the subcutis and even the deeper muscle. And um, I have seen rare exceptions of that that were more like plaque-like and spread out, um, but, uh, but most of the time they infiltrate deeply. So when you see a tumor that is confined to the dermis and relatively circumscribed, when you can see the excision, you can see the edge of the tumor, actually you can kind of draw a line around it. Even though each individual island doesn't look circumscribed at all, the whole thing actually has kind of its own stroma and you can kind of draw an outline, like the tumor stops, look, the tumor stops here, see? It doesn't like go trickling out way away from itself. Um, there is another thing that we look for is the presence of sweat ducts. In microcystic adnexal carcinoma, you should have sweat duct differentiation. The problem is, is that the sweat ducts are often very compressed and it's hard to see them, particularly at the surface of the lesion. I feel like most of the time in MAC, you, looking deeper down is where you start to see obvious sweat ducts. So here I don't see any duct formation. And then the other thing to be careful of is that there are normal sweat ducts in the dermis, remember, eccrine ducts. So you're gonna find like right here, there's a duct, right? But it's just a background sweat duct that's in the middle of here, okay? So if you start seeing more ducts than you should for that given area of dermis, that's when you can start getting worried. These keratin-filled cysts are very characteristic, both of desmoplastic trichoepithelioma and also of microcystic adnexal carcinoma. So that's why it's a really challenging differential to sort out. Um, I wanted to bring this up because A, it's difficult and treacherous and, and a lot rides on it. And B, I want to point out that even though we call this a trichoepithelioma, this doesn't look anything like 
the regular trichoepithelioma I just showed you. Look, let's go back to it. Here's tri conventional trichoepithelioma. And then here's desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So even though they're called under the same name, in my, in my thought, they are really two different tumors. Yeah, they're both benign hair follicle tumors, but they look totally different. Um, so I think that's an important thing to, to remember that this isn't just like a slightly different variant of regular trico -ep. You just have to think of it as a totally separate tumor that um, you, you know, your main differential here is ruling out microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Okay, here's another look, another sweat duct that I think just represents a background entrapped duct. You can use some different stains that people have talked about, um, looking for um, using like CEA to try to highlight duct lumens. Um, I will also sometimes use CK20 here to highlight scattered Merkel cells that are present usually in desmoplastic trico -ep, but not usually in MAC. Um, but again, I feel like in the end, I can do all those stains, but I'm still gonna usually say, well, just go do a small excision so I can see the base of the lesion in, in any event. And in the past, I would often say that nerve involvement was a really strong indication of microcystic adnexal carcinoma. But then uh, the group from uh, Yale published a paper showing that actually a majority of desmoplastic trichoepitheliomas have involvement and wrapping of small nerves in the dermis by tumor cells. And at first I thought there's no way that's true, but then I actually read the paper and it was very convincing and all of the patients went on to have good follow-up. And I actually recently, well, it was a little while ago, a year or so ago, had a case like that. And after reading the paper, I was convinced enough that I, I told the surgeon, I think even though the margins are positive, I actually feel like I can see the base of the lesion. I feel like it's okay to just watch and wait. And it spared this young woman having to have a bigger surgery on her face. So here's an example that we happen to find right here. This is a tiny little dermal nerve and it's totally wrapped by an island of basaloid cells. So this is an area where I totally changed my viewpoint and the way I practice pathology based on a paper. And I thought, what a kudos to those, uh, to those authors, right? When you write a paper good enough that it changes the way people practice, that's the kind of papers we should be writing and publishing uh, in the literature. Okay, so, but here's a case though where I'm glad that I had the excision to remove the entire thing so we can actually see the whole lesion. Okay. Now, in contrast, and I'll just tell you what the diagnosis is here. This is microcystic adnexal carcinoma. Don't look too exciting at first until you get down closer. Sweat ducts and more and more and more and more. They're everywhere. And yes, this is just background eccrine coils, normal eccrine sweat glands. Oh, the reference is, um, I'll actually send you the link. Google's wonderful. There you go. Oh, wait, that went privately. Why not to the everyone? So here's the paper that I'm referencing by um, Dr. Yedrich and LaFell and McNiff. And really, it's a very beautifully done paper. Not only is it nice because it's really interesting cases and it's a very well laid out argument, it actually goes into discussing about why things, why perineural invasion happens in carcinomas and what other things can grow around nerves. Uh, it's really, really actually very cool from like kind of a, a basic skin biology perspective and it's a beautifully written paper. So I, I, it was one that stands out in my mind as a paper I read and I was incredibly um, uh, impressed by. So bravo to those authors. And uh, also I know Dr. McNiff uh, from a long time for working with her at ASDP and she's just really a fantastic person too. All right, so so here we can see that we've got those little basaloid, elongated, tadpole-like islands, but we've got lots and lots and lots of sweat ducts. Notice something. This is a carcinoma, but how much atypia do you see there? None. These are bland tumors. If you see an infiltrative tumor that looks ugly and you think might be MAC, it's not MAC. Almost certainly not, okay? I'm sure there's exceptions, but that if I see ugly infiltrating cords, I think about, is this a, an infiltrative squamous cell carcinoma? Or is this a metastatic adenocarcinoma from somewhere else in the body, okay? So I wasn't gonna go into metastases here, but if you were debating between a metastasis versus say microcystic adnexal carcinoma, and you could only do one immunostain to help sort those out, what would you do to sort out a, a skin adnexal tumor from a metastatic adenocarcinoma? Any takers, you can type it into the chat box. This is one of these little things of a 
uh, that I actually find very helpful in real practice and, and I use it a lot. No one, no one's taking it. EMA, good idea. So keratin is going to stain this, but it's also going to stain metastatic carcinoma. Mucicarmine will stain anything that makes mucin, which this tumor is not make, um, epithelial mucins. This is not making epithelial mucin, so that could help if you have a, an adenocarcinoma that's making epithelial mucin. CK7 can stain a lot of different sweat gland tumors, and so can EMA. EMA can also stain squamous cell carcinomas, um, for that matter. CEA will highlight these ducts, that's true, but it will highlight a lot of different um, uh, adenocarcinoma ducts. So the answer in my book is P63 or P40, which both work, work equivalently in my experience, that those are the vast majority of skin adnexal tumors, both benign and malignant, with a few exceptions like mucinous carcinoma and some apocrine carcinomas in the skin will be P63 negative. But most other adnexal tumors, benign ones and malignant ones, as well as basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and seborrheic keratosis, all of the epidermal derived tumors, all of those tumors are going to have strong diffuse P63 and P40 expression in their nuclei, whereas adenocarcinomas from visceral organs are usually negative for those markers. Uh, one exception is that a small subset of lung adenocarcinomas can express P63, which is why P40 basically became popular to help uh, lung pathologists sort out adeno versus squame. So I found that P, the published data talks mostly about P63 as supportive of the skin adnexal tumors versus metastatic adeno, but I found that P40 works similarly. And it's a really crisp stain, it's really strong, it's not wishy-washy, so I use that all the time when I'm trying to help rule out a metastatic adeno. If it ends up being P40 positive and it's in the skin, it's probably not an adenocarcinoma from inside the, the visceral uh, component, okay? from the, the uh, internal organs. Um, now that doesn't work with squamous cell carcinoma, of course. Squamous cell carcinoma from any site is gonna be P63 and P40 negative, I'm mean, sorry, P63 and P40 positive, regardless of whether it's from the lung or the cervix or the skin or the oropharyngeal area. Okay, so the thing is, is that MAC has these ducts, but oftentimes the ducts are not visible until you go way down. In this case, they're more obvious, but the ducts, what, one thing that can help you with ducts is seeing little pink secretion inside them. For any sort of sweat duct um, differentiation in a tumor, sometimes it's hard to tell, is that just a white space or is it actually a duct? If you find pink secretion inside of it, that supports the idea that it's probably a real duct. Here's a more example, see? That's inspissated or dried up sweat secretion that's clogging up these little ducts. But look, as we go down, it just keeps going and keeps going and now we're down in the muscle and it's still there, and it's in the fat and the muscle, and it also is gonna usually involve nerves. You, perineural invasion is very common in this tumor, but like I said, small dermal nerves are often involved in the setting of desmoplastic trichoep, so just seeing it, a tumor around nerves in the dermis is not enough to make something into a MAC. Uh, here's an example. Here is a nerve, a big nerve, with intraneural. It looks like normal sweat ducts, but they're in the middle of a big, deep nerve. So this is microcystic adnexal uh, carcinoma, and this is actually, I think, probably the best, most classic example that I've ever seen. Um, and I will point out, let's see if they have them in this case. Usually these tumors do have little keratin-filled cysts superficially. So again, it makes them look quite a bit like, no, this one actually doesn't, but usually, usually they have those little keratin cysts just like desmoplastic trichoepitheliomatous. Um, Okay, so that's an example of uh, MAC, microcystic adnexal carcinoma.